Professor, thank you very much for your time. And it's good to have you here again after our meeting in valuation class. And nowadays I'm busy with your translations and I should say your this work in Turkey was very loud. And thank you. It's, it's in the beginning of the year, came to the market exactly with the same uh, structure. And I got a lot of good feedbacks. Everybody loved it. And I got plenty of questions. And what would you like to say our audience about this book? I, you know, I think that you know, I've, I've, having taught uh, valuation for 36 years, I tell people everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching it. It's a craft. And uh, one of the interesting things that about, about, about a craft is the more you work at it, the more you realize you've made it overcomplicated, that life is simpler than you think. So as you get better at a craft, it actually gets simpler. The greatest chefs have simplified cooking. They don't read a 15 item recipe and try to do it from scratch in 25 steps. They've simplified it. And I think that's what, that's what we should all aspire to do is as we value companies, we have to learn ways in which we can simplify things. And it's not just in the way we value companies, the way we explain valuations. One of the things that always troubles me is valuation experts who intimidate people by throwing in buzzwords and by using big formulas and equations. Basic valuation is common sense. You should be able to explain it to anybody, even your 85-year-old aunt who sits next to you at the dining table and says, hey, can you tell me why you came up with the value of the company at this? You should be able to explain it in language that anybody can understand. So I really like writing the little book of valuation because it forced me to get away. It's easy to write books with buzzwords and complexities. It's far simpler to make things simple and straightforward. I haven't got there yet, but I'm continuing to work on simplifying what I know because one of these days, I think I should be able to compress in a way that anybody should be able to walk away saying, I can do that. And you are not just telling the theory, you're also bringing the companies from the real life with practices and evaluating not just one type of company, in a wide range of companies you are valuing, I guess. And, and I do it. I mean, I would love to tell you that I'm doing this for other people, but I do it for myself. I mean, I like to be interested in the things that I value. And if I value the same type of company over and over and over again, I'd be incredibly bored. So I go young companies, old companies, emerging market companies, developed com market companies, because it keeps my interest level high. Again, using the cooking analogy, if all you do is cook pasta day after day after day, you're going to get really good at cooking pasta, but you're going to get bored. And just as trying different cuisines actually keeps things fresh, I think valuing different companies keeps my knowledge and my interest fresh. That's a very good point, Professor. And I should recommend anyone to this book, but please not deceive it with the name, the little book. Yes, it is little when you compare to other books. They are really, really good books, but uh, it's just a name. Content is probably denser than the others. And if we could move linear in the timeline, now I'm at the moment translating one of another your books and no one knows that publicly. Would you, Make the good news by yourself, Professor? Could you the, of, all, of all the books I've written, this was the book that I had the most fun writing. And it's a book that actually deviates the most from what I've historically done. Historically, I've done valuation books, basically the techniques, the processes of valuation. But over the last 35 years, I've noticed something very troubling, which is as we get more access to data and our tools get more powerful, our valuations are actually, I think in my view, getting qualitatively worse. It's because we've lost sight of a fundamental truth, which is evaluation can never just be a collection of numbers in a spreadsheet or a financial model. In every valuation, you're telling a story, a story about the company. So what I did in this book is go back to the process of how you connect stories to numbers. And I wrote this book, not just for people doing valuation, but for people who are running businesses who want to talk about what's my story for a company, because you're a founder or a CEO. You're not telling people about your growth rates, you're telling a story about your company. 
In fact, you could argue that the greatest companies in the face of the earth are the ones which have had the most compelling stories and the most compelling storytellers. Amazon, perfect example. A company that's told the same story for 30 years and has been consistent in telling that story. And look at what, how it's been rewarded, $2 trillion value. So I think this book is really about connecting stories, numbers. And as you read the book, I hope that what you will find is valuation is a lot more interesting than Excel spreadsheets where you enter numbers. It forces you to think about businesses, understand businesses, and how things connect to create the value for a business. I know, thank you. I know that you're a number cruncher, but your story with Moby Dick is really, really funny. Could you explain us in, in a couple of sentences how it is with the narrative people and number crunchers meet each other? Yeah, you know, I, I ask people in my class whether what comes more naturally to them. Are you more naturally a number cruncher or a storyteller? And, uh, you know, because it's a valuation class, people self-select about two thirds of my class are number crunches, recovering accountants, bankers, mathematicians, scientists, actuaries. The other one third are storytellers, history majors, literature majors, people who haven't seen a number in 10, 15, 20 years. And when I make people self-select, the numbers people think they have the upper hand. They think, hey, we're the ones who are going to do well in this class. And I tell them that, look, you know, it's easier to teach a storyteller how to work with numbers than to get a number cruncher to work with stories. So I tell people, look, you give me a hundred history majors, I can teach them how to value a company overnight. You give me a hundred accountants or bankers, I struggle more because they come in with preconceptions. They have this view that if you tell a story, it's a sign of weakness. They think a number is a sign of strength and precision. So I think that part of this is just letting, I mean, I tell people, work on your weak side. We all have a strong side and we want to go to that strong side. What can you be weak side? Because valuation requires a balance of skills. And that balance of skills is what most of us lack because of specialists. We, we are rewarded for specialization. And that actually gets in the way of good valuations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I agree. And both sides benefit from this process, I guess. Number crunchers get to learn make better stories and storytellers make their learn, numbers. Learn the discipline of number crunching because if you're a pure storyteller, what happens is you often tell stories that are disconnected from reality, fairy tales. Why? Because it's easy to tell big stories. What number crunching does, it creates enough discipline in the process that you don't get carried away. Mm -hmm. So it makes storytellers into more. So, you know, one of my end games in my class is I say, by the end of this class, I turn to the storytellers and say, I hope you're disciplined storytellers. And then I turn to the number crunchers and say, by the end of this class, I hope you're imaginative number crunchers. Because to me, that's the combination that makes for good valuations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to put this video on YouTube because I am adding Turkish subtitles for the valuation videos of yours. That's a really good, great playlist. And when this book is in the market, if I can finish translation work, I recommend this book, not just to financial people, financial uh, interested people, because as you stated, very good professor, there is, there is something for decision makers. There is something inside for the managers, and there is something for the people who are trying to pursue the way of self-improvement. So these self-help books, better than the self-help books, I would say. Sure. I, I, I'm not sure it's better, but I think what I hope we all can use is humility. I mean, in markets, the biggest sin, sin is arrogance. And arrogance often comes from believing that you have the high ground, that you own the right way of thinking. And I've learned the hard way that there is no right way of thinking, that there's always something in everybody else's views that can make my story better. So if nothing else, if, we, if you can get that out of the book, I hope it makes you better, both at storytelling and at number crunching. And what is also good, as I understand from this book, when the story changes, number changes too. So if we see the evaluation, then we make mistakes. A company from this date is, might be very different in a following date. So yeah. We have to update our story. story. I mean, I give the example of COVID. Think of what Zoom did for, of what COVID did for Zoom. 
made its story huge. And think of what COVID did to Carnival Cruise Lines, made its story much smaller. And it was an act of God. I mean, again, a sign of humility, which is you can tell the best story there is in the world, but God has other plans and your story. And so that's why I think humility is called for, because there's so much in your story you don't control. And that means you've got to be open to the possibility, the reality that the story will change. And as the story changes, as you pointed out, your valuation should too. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much, dear professor. As a good student of yours, I'm very involved with your books, videos, and following your also blog. And in the future, I would like to be translate one of another your articles in your blog. Uh, and I would be honored for that. And I look, for, I look forward to it. Thank you, Agrinath. Thank you, professor.